Well, welcome everybody and welcome to everybody who is uh, logging in online. I know sometimes with the Zoom connections, it takes a couple minutes to uh, get the program downloaded and everything, but I am committed to starting on time because I think that we have an urgency around uh, improving food system sustainability. So there's no time to waste. So let's get started. So I'm Robin Curry and I'm the director of the uh, sustainable food programs here at Prescott College. And, um, you know, our programs here, especially our Master of Science in Sustainable Food Systems, uh, really supports people uh, to work in their own communities. We're an online program, and so we're definitely committed to students joining in uh, to see what they can uh, learn to better their own uh, food systems, to help rebuild their own food systems so that they're healthy um, and just uh, for members in their community. We're so pleased to welcome uh, Barbara gemmel Heron and Hans Heron uh, for the talk today on challenges in transforming of agriculture in food systems. So the introductions will go in alphabetical order. I tried it by first name and by last name, and Barbara's the winner. So <laughs> Barbara <laughs> recently joined the faculty here at Prescott College. Um, in the Sustainable Food Systems Program, and is really one of the world's foremost authorities on pollination ecology. And that's how I came to know Barbara and Barbara's work as I was studying pollination ecology in Central Asia. Um, her recent positions with the UN Food and Agricultural Organization has most recently focused on agroecology, ecosystem services, and food security. So just to give you the broad topics, you'll learn more about her specific work. Um, she most recently led the development of the Food and Agricultural Organization's um, biodiversity mainstreaming strategy, and that became the foundation approved, adopted uh, on December 4th <laughs> of last year. Um, but that became the foundation of a course that she developed for us here at Prescott College um, surrounding ecosystem services. She was previously the executive director of the Environment Liaison Center International based in Nairobi, Kenya, um, and helped to establish the African Pollinator Initiative. She was a professor at the University of Nairobi, supervising postgraduate students uh, there. Um, she was also the coordinator of the International Pollinator Initiative. See why somebody studying pollination would bump into Barbara's work. Um, and, uh, uh, then in 2018, she was appointed to the UN Committee uh, on Food Security's high-level panel of experts, because no low-level panels are allowed um, in, in UN system. The high-level panel of experts, uh, project team on agroecological approaches and other innovations for sustainable agri-food systems that enhance food security and nutrition. I highly encourage all of you to pop on to the FAO's website and look uh, for the 10 elements of agroecology and Barbara's signature is all over that work. It's fascinating things and my dream is to develop a program with Barbara that's based around those 10 elements. So watch this space. Um, Dr. Hans Heron, is uh, founder, president, and CEO of uh, the Millennium Institute um, and current chair of the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements, which I know is of interest to many of you in the uh, social justice and community organizing uh, program. So welcome uh, to joining us. Uh, Hans's studies were in agronomy and entomology, both in Switzerland and in the United States. Um, and he worked for 27 years in Africa in biological control, plant, human, and environmental health. In 1995, Hans was awarded the World Food Prize um, in recognition for having protected a significant portion of Africa's uh, food supply uh, uh, for devising. He devised an organic, a biological control uh, method for controlling the cassava mealybug. Um, and the impact was uh, widespread, broad, and critically important for food security in Africa. Um, he also uh, was awarded the 
Right to Livelihood Award, which I think if you don't track that as closely as you track the Nobel uh, Peace Prize Awards, you, you should. So let that be a recommendation. I'm not afraid of saying should. You know, this is food security stuff. There are things we must do, we should do. So check that out. Um, he also has had a role in establishing not the um, um, not just the Millennium Institute, but also um, uh, the BioVision Foundation and uh, BioVision um, in Kenya. Um, and that organization, so you get an idea of the more on the on the ground community development um, efforts, is um, aimed at sustainably improving life for people in Africa while conserving the environment as the basis of life. And that seems a model that we should be learning from and uh, replicating. Um, so he also co-chaired the International Assessment of Agricultural Knowledge, Science, and Technology for Development, uh, which was published in 2008, and was Director General of the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology in Nairobi, Kenya. So thank you. We're so pleased to have the both of you here and uh, to help us understand how we can be addressing some of these challenges and transforming food systems. Welcome. Yeah, thank you, Robin, for the introduction. Very nice. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here at Prescott and uh, to see so many students here. And I know I'm sure there are quite a few probably on the other end of the wires. I'm very happy to uh, be able to share some of our experience here uh, today with you, in particular when it comes to agriculture and the food system. So um, what are we going to do today here? So we want to talk a little bit about um, the, the pathways uh, for transformation. And so why? I guess that's quite well known to you, but it's always good to have it somewhere as a reference uh, when we start to talk about the what, the how, and the who. Because quite often you know, people know what to do, but then they don't really know how to do it, or then you know who actually is supposed to do it in the end, right? I mean, we, we can do a lot of research. We have a lot of results, and this is the case here. Um, it's still a bit of a problem to see exactly who, uh, and maybe uh, the last question is with what, you know, and because whatever you do needs money. But even there, I think we have uh, good solutions. So this is what sort of our uh, food system looks like in the field. When you think about what's going on in Asia in terms of uh, the production of uh, palm oil, it is a total disaster. I know, never mind that some company uh, pretend to do good like Unilever. If you actually go and look what they do good, it's a very small portion, maybe less than 1% of the surface area they have uh, deforested are now uh, put back you know, as reserves for the orangutan, for example. And I've been there and seen it. It's really pretty awful. And um, that, like many other things, have a lot to do with ourselves. I think it's our own behavior and what we eat. Uh, on the other hand, you can go to Brazil or Canada, and this is what you see these days, Argentina, uh, just feels as far as you can look with one crop, and if possible with one genetic background. You know, this is not only bad for the environment, it's actually very stupid from a food security point of view. Uh, you know, it's we need, only need a bug there or a disease, and uh, everything goes because you really expose yourself to tremendous risk with having this type of monoculture. Uh, you can go in other places, rapeseed, for example, even in Europe these days, you know, you can look in the spring, you look yellow over the hills and down. You know, sort of earlier we had a smaller fields, forest, uh, bushes in between these days, uh, everywhere, you know, monocrops bigger, which many think it's always uh, better. Uh, or here, uh, uh, corn. And why is, you know, because that's where it ends up, you know, in, in processed food. And this is not the most processed one you can see. Um, but just as an example that uh, it is what we do, what we have in our plates, which very much also dictate what the farmers do. So, so there is, it is a circular issue. And um, we'll talk more a bit about, uh, uh, you know, what, what we can do. So again, climate is changing, but you know, a lot of that is due to agriculture and the food system. People talk about 30% is due to agriculture. Actually, it's half. And there's it a fairly good report uh, out there from grain 
uh, where they studied this in, in greater detail. So if you look at the food system, uh, it's almost half. So I think we can do something by changing the food system in terms of uh, mitigating uh, uh, climate change. And also, while we mitigate, we adapt. And I think that's an important part also uh, uh, for the needed change. Now on the production, uh, you probably see that all the time, there's, oh, we're gonna have to go hungry, we need more food, we need to produce more. By the way, we produce exactly twice as much as we need today for even 10 billion people, not only 7.5. So there's all this waste, not only what we throw away, but I mean, through all the value chain, there's a lot, a lot of losses uh, when you think about, and that also has to change. That cheap food is so cheap that it's actually cheaper to throw it away than to save it. And it's, it's cheaper, again, to put some fertilizer out there, some more pesticides, uh, increase production, uh, then actually, on the other hand, you know, do the, do the savings. But again, that's all due because we are not really looking at, at the cost or the total costs and more on this one later also. So we need to stop, you know, this, uh, this wastage and these losses. And, you know, when people think that the food system we have now is actually okay, it's not. How come that when we have too much production, we have so much hunger uh, in the world? Actually, it's interesting that on this graph here, on this uh, picture, the U.S. is not there. But in the U.S., 42 million people actually are on food stamps don't they, or don't get enough food. In Europe, exactly the same number. So it's not only actually in the developing countries where we go and count, but also uh, here where we have tremendous problems with, with hunger in a food system, which a lot of people would like to see duplicated everywhere. And we've been in Africa for long enough to see you know, how much pressure there is to abandon uh, sort of the small scale agriculture uh, for large type agriculture, a la US, Canada, name it, Brazil or Argentina or Australia. And, uh, and again, you know, a lot of people are trying to push against, but uh, the investments these days, as we know, uh, are going still in the wrong direction, despite all the talk. Um, we have out there. In addition, that food system also has shifted, you know, from having a diverse, uh, more diversity to less diversity, and from less processed to more processed food. And that's why we got so much corn, soybean, uh, palm oil out there, because there's nothing you can buy in the in the store where not one of these things doesn't occur. Or cure, almost. So, so and, and some of the better uh, uh, crops, many root crops also in particular, which are needed in, in, a, in a sustainable crop rotation, are, are being abandoned or pushed aside. A food system which has so many obese people around, it cannot be right. On the one hand, we have the hunger. On the other hand, we have obesity. We have also... Um, 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 another disease, um, um, diabetes, right, which is enormous. They have done some surveys in Africa. I mean, this, this is the next big thing after malaria, probably even worse. It's also linked to, to a bad diet, very starchy diet, too much corn. And, um, you know, we start to talk about the maceification. Here you say the cornification of, of the world. It is, it is insane when you look at what's going on. Totally. Uh, to promote a crop like maize, the way it's being done right now, even by the International Ag Research Institutes, which are spread out the tropics, uh, is, is irresponsible when we know how much water they use, how actually bad nutrition they provide for people compared to uh, sorghum, compared to millet, and to other crops. But it's simple. Let's just do one thing, um, uh, and a lot of money producing seeds, hybrids, GMO if possible. So, so, so th this is the trend. And I mean, that leads to these big problems we have now, and it will bankrupt many countries on the health side, uh, as, as we also uh, know already. Now, again, the environmental damage is enormous, and you know it. This is an example from the US, the hypoxia uh, from the soybean and, and uh, maize, corn production, um, and everything comes down the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico, and we have these mega uh, dry, uh, dead zones uh, there. And again, the big uh, 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 
problems makers. Really, I can see here, I guess, you know, this is the corn, soybean, and then uh, we have basically the other crops, uh, which, which are responsible for a lot of, of these problems. And for what? For making ethanol, which we don't need, to make more processed food, which we shouldn't, corn starch syrup, which I know the one thing you see everywhere, which is so bad for health. But uh, we all know, you know, how much effort has been made to push back on this, but you can't get anywhere, it seems to. Again, and why? Because there are some powers at play, and we'll talk about this also a bit more. So now all this is threatening our planet very badly, and uh, you all know the Rockstrom uh, paper from way back, and wh where um, the, the team showed, you know, how we are getting over the limits um, in, in terms of our uh, boundaries. You know, what can the planet afford? And being it in the, uh, um, uh, the nitrogen uh, production, and phosphorus, these are the red spots down here, right? uh, or up here, when we're looking uh, at uh, the biodiversity one. And as we should be in the green, we are you know, moving in the yellow. And as far as I can see, I think we, are keep, we keep going uh, more and more you know, in, into the red. And there's very little signs that actually anything is changing. And on the second uh, uh, picture here, um, Campbell et al., what they tried to do is to see okay, what proportion of this uh, overshooting of our boundaries are due, due, due to agriculture. And I think we should have a red face, all of us, in agriculture, right? I mean, this is in incredible. And so, so it, it's difficult to, to, to backtrack. I mean, biodiversity, when it's gone, it's gone, right? We can't recreate it. Never mind, some people think we can, but I don't think we can. <laughs> or, or, or should, anyway. So we depend, uh, actually, agriculture and, and sustainable agriculture depends very much on ecosystem services. And uh, when you look at bee, bees, everybody knows that, that's the tip of the iceberg. You know, there's a number, there are a lot of other elements in that system we depend on. And, and finally, biodiversity has been also put forward as one of the key issues for the future in the famous report, which has been published recently uh, by IPB, IPBES, IPES Food, um, uh, which um, has shown, again, you know, that agriculture, and biodiversity loss are very closely connected and that we need to do something about it. So even the people in biodiversity are now looking more and more also toward agriculture and the IPBES report is showing uh, uh, this very clearly. Land degradation. Well, in some places, land is very deep, right? The soils are very deep, so people think, oh, we don't have to worry. Um, but actually, if you think about how thin that crust is, which supports us, it's really, I think, something we need to start to think about much harder uh, if we want to continue to grow our food. Because I don't believe, and many of them, I think uh, I'm not the only one, uh, that we can grow all our food in uh, vertically in, in buildings or maybe in the water somewhere, as some uh, I try to, to, to say already. So I think we have to take care of our soil, uh, number one, in land degradation. More than half the land is degraded one way or another, more than a third very badly. So I think that's one thing we need to deal with. And when you look here at, the, at this map, okay, so uh, climate change predicted yield change. And I want to mention it, when you look at something like this, you have to remember that this is on the business as usual. That's a, it's, we continue with sort of our green revolution type agriculture and promote this even more and further. And, and because that would, on the other hand, then promote climate change, which has, again, the feedback effect. So we were, we were in this sort of a spiral, a reinforcing loop, uh, which makes things worse. Um, and that's why, again, we need to change the system and, and not, not, not only just sort of uh, uh, have uh, or treat the symptoms, which is most of us people do these days, treating symptoms. And well, we have data, you know, we know where we should be and we know where we're going to be. And probably, it's probably worse than what we say. I mean, again, the report you read almost on a daily basis said that, whoa, God, oh, we have underestimated again something somewhere. i never seen that we have overestimated something somewhere. And particularly when it comes to the methane issue right now, which I think is, is, is tremendous. So, so again, we have got another problem there. And so, you know, Paris Agreement to, come on, this is already behind us. 
I think we, 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 we can say for sure three, four degrees, which means in certain places, 10 or more degrees. So, so that's, that's really huge. Um, and, and here in this little graph, you can see how uh, uh, by 1.5 to 2 degrees. Okay, so we don't, we're getting into the, the darker colors where it means big problems already for almost everything. And if you look let's just go at the food supply here, we already have a problem now, uh, you know, by 1.5. When we are at 1.3 now or something, right? Roughly. So we're already entering that zone and yeah, we know it. We can see uh, problems in many places around the world where uh, food supply is no longer assured. And then we look a little bit at the other impact. For example, the endocrine disruptor chemicals. This is uh, yet another side of this uh, uh, coin um, when you think about how our industrial agriculture is working and working against the people who consume that food later on. Uh, and the endocrine uh, disruptor, I mean, they, they are everywhere. Um, and come also from mostly from pesticide and not the least herbicide use. So these are big numbers. When we think how much it would take to change the system, uh, which we calculated this, would be less than 140 billion a year uh, in, 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 uh, until 2015, uh, we could actually reverse and transform the system to agroecology, global. And that's even half of the subsidies which are being paid today to farmers in Europe and the US. So, so nobody should tell us there's not enough money. And if we don't start to save on the other end, sure there won't be enough because if we do anything immediately, costs would only grow. And here, a friend of us, uh, Nadia Shalaba, who used to work with FAO, put together an interesting, interesting table which shows again you know, the impact of different activities related on, on to uh, health, you know, how, how uh, in the system, across the system, uh, it affects not only the environment, it affects the, the farm workers, for example, it's actually the consumers. Um, and, and here, uh, again, these endocrine disruptors are really a major issue, which gets being denied uh, for, by the industry. I mean, how much pushback do we have? I'm a, I'm a founder of the Monsanto Tribunal, among other things. And uh, we, we condemn Monsanto for the glyphosate and you know, the, the havoc they create around the globe uh, for crime against humanity and ecocide. So these things are actually enshrined in this table also. But again, not much is happening except they are losing a few court cases, but I think uh, not enough yet. So let's see what's come, what will be coming. So how do we create this problem? You know, what happened really when we look back and so when we look back, what we figured out is that um, we, we have, or we had down here, ecosystem services, pollination, pest control, water cycling, nutrient cycling in the soil, and we had the farmers. And they're producing food, row crops, other crops. And, what, what, and so with that, we produced our food, our, nourished our animals and ourselves. But there's something you cannot do with this system here make a lot of money. So what happened? So some smart people out there decided, let's uh, sort of replace ecosystem services with, with products. And those products, what are these? Okay, we have large scale irrigation because our water cycling doesn't work properly. We have all these pesticides, herbicides, uh, hybrid seeds, GMOs. So basically what, what was given us free here I mean, free, we had to maintain it, we had to take care of it. So it was a cost, maybe not 100% free, but this was replaced by, by this here. And then eventually, so we end up with this sort of very costly and, and uh, destructive uh, type of agriculture. So how should we move forward? Uh, Robin mentioned that I was a co-chair co of this uh, famous report here of the IAASTD. And it's been now 10 years, 11 years since uh, we, we published this report. 400 people worked for almost three years writing this report, which was twice peer reviewed on a global scale. The biggest thing ever done on agriculture to figure out. So one global report and five sub-regional reports. There's one for North America and Europe. If you're interested, you have to go to this website here in Germany, 
which uh, where still you can download these reports if you don't know them or don't have access to them. Uh, because already 10 years ago, we said we need to go to agroecology. That was the big line. And business as usual is not an option. All right, 10 years later, well, we'll hear how much has happened or, or not happened. But I think we are still on, on the short end of it. So there's been more report written, uh, more people out there saying we need to do something, ridiculed by some. Uh, and I think the, the, the most salient thing came out in last year was this IPCC report, which finally included agriculture as one of the problem and the solution made finally. You know, we've been sort of pushing and pushing many people, uh, probably in the room here too, and nothing happened. And finally, they, they realized that what I said before, you know, if we produce so much CO2 and contribute so much to climate change, there's got to be a way that we can be part of the solution also. And that's what is happening. So what we want is really a system change. We want to go to the root of the problem and, and really deal uh, uh, with the causes and not with the symptom as I said before, which is usually what is being done. And so here, again, so this is sort of a simplified version of the system. And that's why we need to start to use the tools we have since many years to actually better understand the system to figure out where are the main or key leverage points where we can actually get real leverage to get move, to move things in the right direction. And, and for that, a lot of work is being done now by a number of institutions in terms of system models to try to understand better the system and see uh, where and how we can move forward. And here I try to represent the system. So here it is sort of our former system uh, and uh, sustainable agriculture. And that was the diet which was going with it. So you can see it's heavy on the green and not so much on the red. And then we decided, well, why don't we do a bit upside down? We, can, uh, we have the money now. We know how to do kaffos, so we can produce sort of meat cheap, so we can produce meat and dairy like mad. All right. So what happened? The agriculture became black, dark, produced a lot of CO2. Becomes part of the problem we want to solve. So if you want to solve this and go back here, we're going to have to change that. No way around it. And um, so, so that's what we say. And here, I think, if it's uh, uh, good for you, it's also good for the planet. Uh, and this actually uh, pyramids come from the Barilla uh, pasta company in Italy, who is now sourcing most of their uh, grain for, for their pasta from organic or agroecologically produced uh, uh, um, cereals. So some people, are, some companies are, are trying. Um, they come up actually, Barilla, they have very interesting reports also uh, out there. And yes, it's in the plate. So it is really our job, I think, to, to force the farmers to change because we in the end buy. If, it's, if we don't buy it, it won't be produced at the end of the day, right? I, I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, we have to really take this very seriously. And that we have choices. And many people don't make the right choice because it costs a bit more. Now, if that comes, then we'll talk about it later. So um, where are we with agroecology then? Because that's where we need to go. And so here we have, I tried to represent this, it's not so easy, because so where is organic? You see, organic is not fully in agroecology, nor is permaculture, agroforestry, and the pieces outside here are mostly the social components uh, of, of, of those systems. Um, and agroecology, which is you know, the latest definition, uh, uh, Stephen Glissman really includes the food system. I think that's what we have to take as the big thing. And that's why when we look at the ecological agriculture, all this again, you know, they are not really fully in there and there's a lot out there too. And Barbara talked to you about some, Barbara will talk to you a little bit more about some of those outliers there, which uh, uh, they also looked at in the um, CFS report. And now, Barbara, it's your turn. <laughs> That's your, your baby. Well, it, it, yes, this is a, is a bit my baby, but just briefly, I think Hans will come back soon. But just to say, I think a change is in the air. I mean, we've certainly created the, um, the problem space, but the solution space, I believe, is opening up 
to, to a large extent right now. And I just say that over sort of recent history that during my time at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, in my first uh, years there, we were not allowed to talk about ecological solutions. This was really not something that was being supported. It was very much green revolution, conventional agriculture, although there were several of us working on elements that just don't fit with that, like pollination and uh, natural pest control. And we did get a, a new director at, at one point who was Brazilian and understood, uh, he's a very political animal, he understood agroecology, also understood very conventional agriculture, but he opened, the, he opened it up for us and he said, you can go there. And he invited us to, to start an initiative on agroecology at FAO. And we had a, our first symposium in 2014 and it was very um, open and participatory. It was unlike any UN meeting I've ever seen at FAO. People clapped and cheered, which you don't usually do in one of those meetings. And um, we brought in a lot of people who really understand agroecology from on the ground in Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America. The US was less represented and that's always a question to us. Why, why is this movement that really is gaining a lot of traction around the world, why doesn't it find a home also in North America? But after this opening up the, the window for agroecology, we needed to sort of define what that would mean for FAO and what the work we would do. And rather than go into definitions, which are things that are heavily negotiated, what you include, what you don't include, we decided to really just try to identify the elements of agroecology, the substantive elements of, um, you know, many of them are related to the biophysical side, uh, diversity, synergies, recycling, efficiency, but equally in agroecology and indivisible are the ones that are the more social elements of responsible governance, uh, human and social, social values, culture and food traditions, and um, circular and solidarity economies. So this has been accepted by, uh, just to say that, that we, you, you know, you can put this forward, but what seems to us to kind of move, move the dice in some way is when we have 187 member countries in FAO, when they adopt this, they agree that this, yes, this is, these are, make sense and we want uh, the international community and each one of our countries to work on this. So these 10 elements were adopted also, that was just middle of last year. And then I hand it back to Hans. Yeah, well, we're going to take them by their words. I think that's the important part because, you know, the, do I agree to something is one thing, actually to go into home and do it is another. So uh, that's why we are all here and try and make sure that we, uh, uh, we make the people accountable for the decisions they, they, they make. Um, all right, so I don't know if you know the uh, IPES, IPES food as we uh, call it, the International Panel of Experts in Food Systems. I'm a member of this. We are about 26, I think, uh, experts, so-called, <laughs> uh, in food system, and we crank out reports uh, on all sorts of topics, on, on food and health. We have done on, on food uh, um, uh, environmental issues. Um, we have uh, the, one of the reports, which was published in 2016, which uh, this slide comes from, is called From Uniformity to Diversity. And um, uh, that report, I think, uh, as if you don't know it, uh, go look at it. It's a very interesting, and it has led to a number of new reports now uh, coming out. Uh, one is on money flows, uh, which analyzes again sort of the power relationship in, in the in the system. But what we say in there is that you know we need to transform, but not only the industrial uh, agriculture. This is important. Also, uh, the subsistence of agriculture. We need to get out of there because, first of all. There won't be many farmers left who want to do that in the developing countries soon. You know, it's, hard, it's back breaking. There's no money in it. So that's why people go into towns and swell uh, the, the, um, the slums. So I, again, everywhere, I think we need to work and work toward what we call here a diversified agroecological farming. Um, and so that's, that's where, again, I think we, 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 want, to, we want to go to. And there are a number of things we need to do on both sides, again, uh, to build knowledge. And that's important because uh, agroecology, just like organic agriculture, is science-based. It's not like the agriculture of the, gr the grandfather or, 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 I don't know, grandmother way back then when everybody was hungry and the people didn't really uh, manage very well. I think that uh, what we, we, we go, our agriculture we promote now, agroecology, is actually looking forward, not backwards. 
And we are accused, uh, people come to tell me, oh, you with your agriculture, it was going to go hungry. This is what you know, people did 100 years ago or, 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 or further back. They don't acknowledge that organic agroecology is science-based. And I think we have a job here to continue to, to bring for uh, the evidence, and again, peer-reviewed, published. And evidence, and we have plenty, but it's never enough to convince the people we should be convincing. And I think so we need to work on this. Mechanize more diversification, and again, the connection to markets, we know that that's sort of what comes in the most in the subsistence agriculture in developing countries. And when it comes down to the industrial one, again, relocalize. Not this thing that we grow one thing because it grows best in one area and then ship it around the globe. I, I mean, it's maybe economical. Does it make the best of sense? Not only economic, but also environmental and social, I think that's what we have to rethink really about every time we do something. Reduced chemical use. Again, I hear all the time, yeah, you with your organic, you cannot feed the world. I say, well, first of all, we don't feed people, we nourish them, number one. And I think that's one term I, I want to see out of the vocabulary, and certainly here also, of people who want sustainability, we nourish people, we feed animals. And that's the... Because right now, the way I showed you the pictures before, that's basically feeding, right? Corn, soybean, made of palm oil. So I think that's, that's another important point here, I think. So bring in, relocalize the food system, uh, diversify them too, I mean, re-diversify them, there used to be, uh, less chemicals. I mean, again, I want to say in organic, the other proof that we can do without. If we could not do it without chemicals, there wouldn't be any organic food on your, on, on your shelf in the store. Okay? So, and uh, in the valley we live in, California, in the Cape Valley, we have like four fairly large organic farmers, and they produce vegetables for the Bay Area, but in, in large quantities. It works. can be done. Now it's a bit more expensive. Yeah. Okay. I'll talk about this later. And also build knowledge, because those farmers out there who do this... Big farming, I mean, what, it's, it's all remote controlled, more of it, not only their machine, but also their brains. Remote control from, from the pioneer and the fertilizer folks and the Monsantos, right? Or buyer these days. And so here, this is the, the sort of pictures on, on this transformation we were trying to do. Okay, it works again at, at different farm size. It's not only that you can do agroecology on small farms and you have to do industrial scale monocrops on large. No, I think you can. And that's something I think which is, should be promoted more and looked into much more. Help farmers actually to diversify also on larger farms. And yeah, biodiversity is key to sustainability and resilience, so we need more of it. And there was an interesting paper just recently, probably you know it, from Garibaldi and uh, Mendes, um, 2019, I think it came out like, like in August, September last year, where somebody actually looked into this, you know, sort of how diversity uh, is key to sustainability and resilience, how it creates more jobs. Isn't that what we want? So I think, you know, so if you look at it, so it's uh, throughout the, the value chain, to have more diversity will, will help you uh, a lot. So again, uh, you, you have more diverse mechanization, although input are more diverse. So whatever you look, I think you have uh, all, all these benefits. And I think that's, again, something important to consider. So we call it, I call it the solution. And lately, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, how the soil is to be taken care of. We need more life back into the soil because our soils are dead uh, because of all the, the chemicals we put in there, the fertilizer, and the herbicide and pesticides which end up on the, on the soil. And so we need to uh, restore life in the soils. And there's so much interesting work being done these days, also not only on the microorganisms, but on the micro in particular, the fungi, the bacteria, uh, uh, which, which have been known to be extremely uh, uh, important. And uh, when doing this, we can actually, that's one way of getting the carbon down into the ground, which we have released with the dumbest invention of humankind, the plow. And that's been said now by people like Professor Ratan Lal, a former colleague of mine working in Nigeria, uh, who, you know, 
came to his senses too, because way back then he was also a promoter of the plow, but eventually he said, no, that's actually wrong. We need to stop cultivating the ground as we do. We need to keep it covered permanently. And this is a challenge for organic farmers, particularly the organic vegetable farmers, huge challenge. And so that's where again, more research is needed. But now billions have been, have been uh, uh, um, uh, pledged to put the carbon down into the ground on farm. And the big company, uh, Terraton and Indigo, I think they, they, they are now paying farmers, making their own little money. <laughs> Usually the farmer is the one who's going to get that the least, right, out of the whole deal. But uh, as long as you put carbon down the ground is good, maybe one day we can do something different. And so uh, I will pass uh, the word again to Barbara because now she will come with some other very pointed actions uh, uh, we can do. Yeah, just so, just a little bit of my, how, how I've come to this, that um, to me it really began as, as Robin had said, I, I was coordinating the International Pollinator Initiative and working on the, this challenge of, of how we're going to conserve pollinators around the world. And uh, we worked in many countries, that's a, a giant honeybee from Nepal and farmers on, on their rapeseed in, in Brazil, working with this challenge and looking around the world at, for all these different kinds of contexts, how, what farmers can do, um, in some cases not to lose their pollinators or to try and restore them if they have lost them. Uh, just to say that the vast majority of wild plant species are dependent on insect pollination for, um, for fruit and seed set, and that the degree of dependence really increases when you get into tropical areas. So it's, it's critical here, but it's even more critical in tropical regions. And the, the pollination is a really interesting dilemma with respect to diversity, because bio, the more biodiversity, the better. Uh, there's about 20,000 species of wild bees, which many people don't know. They think there's only honeybees, but in fact, it's a broad diversity of wild bees, and the wild pollinators are really more effective pollinators than, than uh, honeybees. But that, they go together with moths, flies, wasps, butterflies, even some, some monkeys and, and some animals. People say giraffes are pollinating acacia trees with their foreheads. Um, it's, it really does bring in broader diversity. <clears throat> and uh, then we've, you know, during the time that we were coordinating this International Pollinator Initiative, a lot more information came out during that time of, of how important pollination services is to, to our diets, that, um, that the, about 75% um, of all crops de depend on pollinators for fruit set and seed set, or for just for their basic uh, size of the fruit that they produce. Um, a small number don't have any increase and many are unknown, but the dependence is, they say, one out of every three bites uh, depends on pollinators, and that's, that's a good way of looking at it. Um, then there's also this very large contribution to human nutrition, vitamin C, and many of the other really important uh, vitamins really occur in the crops that depend on pollinators. So if we have a, a loss of those crops, we're really facing a loss of nutrition. Um, and pollinators contribute very substantially to, to yield and quality. If you don't have good pollinators, you get a miserable little strawberry like the one on the right. And uh, we, we worked with runner beans in Kenya, which is a really interesting system that's grown under incredible inputs. They put out lights to keep a long day, uh, a very long day. It's irrigated. Uh, they put so much, these small scale farmers, but they put a lot into growing their runner beans. And if they don't have sufficient pollination, they get a sickle cell uh, bean that's simply thrown out and, and cannot be exported because they're catering to the export market in the UK. Um, a perfectly fine bean and a lot of work that went into making it, but it's, it's not sufficient. So just to say, we had, we had, we had a long-term project and, and it was very satisfying to be able to work in many different countries working on, um, Robin worked on apples. We worked on apples in Nepal, India, Brazil, uh, it, apples are a really interesting crop in that they grow under so many different conditions, um, South Africa as well. And we had, what was so encouraging about this project was that when farmers face a problem, they, um, they can be so ingenious with coming up with solutions. And uh, the farmers in Northern India, traditionally um, there's an, an indigenous honeybee that often made its nest in people's houses. They made the, the walls of their houses very wide so that the bees could actually nest in the house and they would have a panel in their house they could take down and harvest some honey. 
um, but they don't build their houses that way anymore. And that was really important for the bees to be able to survive during the winter in a somewhat heated environment. It, it really led to their, their thriving in that kind of environment. So our colleagues in, in northern India invented a, a beehive that's shaped like and looks like the little houses that people had and um, made the bees very happy. So it was really nice to have all these different solutions from, from different people. Um, but that's, that's the, the really positive side. But at the end of the day, after this project that went on for many years, I think we all concluded, all of our partners, that while there were many things that we could do, and flowering strips are often suggested as what you can do to increase pollinators, they're, they're really lovely and helpful, but they just are not enough. Just simply putting in a strip of flowering plants, especially if you're still uh, spraying pesticides, but even, even if you stop the pesticides and just the flowering strips, it's not individual measures that you may do, but it's the whole system. And that's where we really had, had come to that conclusion that it has to be a holistic agroecological approach. And for farmers as well, they don't just do one thing, it's their whole, their whole system altogether. So we, we, you know, we really face this idea of a, a, the present paradigm is not sufficient and we really need to meet to develop a new paradigm. Um, another solution that was found, uh, Hans was very much involved in this and it's very well known, the push-pull system in Kenya which has, um, uh, deals with the fact that grasses communicate with insects all the time. They emit pheromones that both some grasses will pull the natural enemy into, into them and to the adjacent uh, maize crop, and other ones will push it away. And this push-pull system then uh, diversifies the system so that you have uh, rows of, of grazing grasses around the, the forage grasses around the crop and then you have the crop and you have also they plant legumes uh, desmodium which presents a plant parasite and it's been an, a tremendously successful system in in diversifying unfortunately these maize systems we, they're now applying them to sorghum and many other systems and it's it's really a, a very interesting way of, of um, encouraging that sort of cultivation um, and also fixing CO2 and bringing in nitrogen into the crop. And then there's uh, biological control, the cassava mealybug biological control that, that Hans was leading. Um, at the time, when we both met at the biological control center at, at UC Berkeley, that doesn't exist anymore. And it, for a long time, biological control was really uh, appreciated and received a lot of funding. Uh, there's almost no funding for biological control anymore, but, um, but it's been proven as a, as a major success. Um, and then appropriate mechanization is certainly part of the solution. Uh, smaller scaled, uh, evidently a lot of ag ag agricultural engineering departments either don't exist or they, they exist to, to uh, work on really large scale mechanization. And this idea of really appropriate technology has um, fallen a bit out of favor, but should really fall back into favor. And, and then uh, education, information, and research and development in agroecology is really key to the transformation. Um, Biovision Foundation that Hans is the president of produces this organic farmer that is uh, distributed first in Kenya, but now it's being spread to many other countries. And it's extremely popular and it really takes farmers' experiences and scientists' experiences, but that have been tested and on the ground. It's, I think, each one of the organic farmer that is distributed, is pat they found that it's passed around to at least 10 or 20 people. Um, it has, has real viability. So we know that agroecology can nourish people and it can nourish people well. So if we take conventional, it, it sort of yields as being 100. We have so much scope for increasing just yields. So we're only talking about yields and not other benefits, but increasing through organic measures in developing countries, increasing it up to 180 as a, me a measure above 100. And organic and industrialized, yes, it may be somewhat of a lower, a lower yield. Um, this is not even, this is not counting any, many of the other benefits that may come from organic, including higher prices. Uh, do you want to mention this? this? Well, you did read French. Yeah. <laughs> it's in French because it, the article was published in French. So as we were having a, an agroecology conference last June in Nairobi, uh, some of the industry, actually I, I have the evidence because I, got, I found the emails, uh, which was working actually with the USDA, uh, the Department of Agriculture, your secretary actually, um, Bayer, Monsanto, uh, Pioneer, 
and they, they pushed back, they went to our donors to try to cut the money and, and basically make, make it impossible for us to hold this conference on agroecology. And they went to the Swiss embassy in Nairobi, tried to also tell them, don't finance this, they doubled the money. So, but I, I, in, in, uh, in, uh, um, uh, in West Africa, I think it was in the, in the Senegal paper, um, there was this article about to export agroecology to Africa is immoral. And there's a whole thing going on right now. They said that it is immoral to, to, to get people to do organic or agroecology because it yields less and it's for the elite, not for everybody. And you, you can go and there's a number of articles out there, which is it's totally crazy. You know? And you can see that because FAO has taken on agroecology, it's now moving, the pushback is increasing. For a while, they ignored us. They said, oh, who cares? 10% of the market, we don't, uh, we don't bother. Now all of a sudden they can see things are moving. Aha, uh -huh, now they're waking up. They're, they're, they see that they're threatened. And ca can you imagine, they feel so threatened by this agroecology conference in Africa uh, that, that they had to go out and, and, and they managed. One of the big donors withdrew the money. And some two of the international centers who had promised to host the conference backed out of it under the pressure that they would be, the money would be cut. Okay, so we are up to something major here um, that established uh, uh, the established powers out there are now waking up and they, they are pushing back. So I think we, you can see your work is really will cut out very well here because we need to continue our battle. Sorry, it's a battle. It's going to be a one uh, for survival. I think, uh, I'm not sure. Oh, okay, yeah. So back to that report from uh, IPES Food. And uh, what we did in there, we did to look at the, why, is the, where, why is no change? Why is it so complicated to make the changes? And so we came up with the, the uh, uh, concentration of power, which is just enormous. And uh, one example is this one. Many people have seen that slide before. Um, the concentration in, in, uh, no, at the end of the value chain. It's mind boggling. It's, it's going on even worse today than whenever this came out 2012. And you would see the same uh, when it looks at the input uh, uh, provider for agriculture. You can look at the fertilizer industry is, is uh, uh, getting more uh, together. Uh, the whole uh, seed industry, which is now linked to the biotech industry and the chemical industry. As you know, there's only three major players left. So, so this is no good. Now, again, it's no good because people say, well, the price will increase. I mean, we should not use any stuff of, the, of that stuff anyway. So um, personally, I, I don't really care what they do. They, are, they have no raison d'etre. I mean, all the Monsanto, all these people. Sure, we need seeds, but we need seeds, again, done in local uh, uh, systems, not in global systems. Can't work, doesn't work. We need different ecotypes for, for different crops, variety. So that's not what this big company is gonna produce. So again, I think that whatever happens, I think we, we, we need to find this uh, concentration of power here and a number of, of uh, very important elements around it. So one is agriculture, this export orientation. You know, I go to India, Modi tells us in a small group, he went because we want to convince him to promote agroecology and organic. He says, yeah, we want to become the, the biggest exporter of agriculture product in the world. What is Brazil trying to do? Argentina, America, Canada. They all want to be the biggest exporter. I say, make sure your people have good food to, to get nourished properly. You, you don't have to send anything down to Africa because if you stop sending things to Africa, people who are actually down there will know very well how to produce their own food. I can tell you that. I've been there long enough to know. So we need to start to, to come to our senses. But again, there's something about agriculture. Oh, we need to export. We need to grow more. You know, ruin all our environment to grow more. California are planting uh, almond like crazy to export to China. Short-term benefit, long-term disaster in terms of water. Right? We know that. Sorry, just keep planting. Um, path dependency, 
yeah, you know, we, we, we are on this path of the green revolution. To get out of it is very difficult. Our institutions are, are somehow um, um, going in that direction, most institutions. So we need institutional changes too. What is the measure of success? Kilogram per hectare or bushels or whatever per acre. That's what is measured. Oh, you're a good farmer. I don't care what the negative is, but you know, how much more quantity. Uh, Short-term thinking, yeah, I mean, everybody is uh, owes money to the bank. So what do we do? Well, uh, quick, we need to produce quickly now to pay the debt. Again, who is uh, paying for in the long term? Compartmentalized uh, thinking, again, you know, people become specialists. Okay, I do uh, livestock, maybe chicken, I do beef, I do dairy, I whatever. But, you know, it is sort of very narrow uh, uh, um, thinking we have out there, and the worst thing is this feed the world narrative. You know, yes. okay, somebody feeds the world. I can. If farmers should feed their community or nourish their community communities, of course, first and foremost, and the, the 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 top one in the end is expectation of cheap food. Anything can have any price, but food has to be cheap. Governments actually are marching also with this. That's why they subsidize a lot of the products, at the farm level, whatever. And that also has no future. It's because of those subsidies that we, are the, we have the system we have now. Because it's corrected, all the negatives are corrected with subsidies. So on the one hand, government gives subsidies and then they charge you taxes to, to pay for the subsidies, right? while we destroy the health, the environment, everything along the line. So, 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 this, so I think this is a very uh, important uh, graph and there are many areas here, you know, which need to be looked at a lot more. But when you look here, in the end, that is money. The power is money. And that's why we started this study with IPES and my foundation on the money flow. There's been a, a pre-study done in the US and one in the UK where they show that over 90%, okay, it's actually 98% of the funding in agri-research today goes to green revolution type agriculture. And organic and all the rest, lucky it gets one or 2%. And what we found out in you know, what uh, the preliminary result of our study, and we took only Switzerland, it takes a lot of uh, Switzerland and, and uh, Kenya, uh, there it doesn't look so bad for the, the Swiss, but then we looked at the Gates Foundation, that looks really bad. Actually, more than half the money goes straight back to the US. Never mind, okay, this is the, the one thing. And then what, what stays down there uh, doesn't do any good, really. I mean, we, we looked at it, it's, it's amazing. Um, and then we looked at what the Kenya government is doing also. And again, the government is actually taking cue from REM, from major donors, again, uh, and uh, uh, consultancy company, the McKenzie et al, who again, you know, continue to promote the old agriculture. That's what they know. So again, they're, they're linked in, in a fixed path. So we need to start to educate people out there much, much more. So in the meantime, so there are a number of actions on the way. So again, my vision is doing some work with our foundation in Africa, uh, FAO with the scaling up agroecology, APS food, we actually have um, a program in West Africa, which is also there to promote agroecology. But uh, so a number of things are actually ongoing and Barbara has been involved in some of them, so she will continue uh, the whole talk here. But to continue on on the, on the hopeful line, so um, an initiative that I have been involved in, in in the last, say, two years or so is, is uh, a study we were asked to undertake by the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, which wanted to look at success stories. They wanted to look at, you know, the fact that many of these, many food system change initiatives start as niches, as small initiatives, and sometimes they stay there, but sometimes they find a way to really start making an impact on social rules and behaviors and start to be able to, through opportunities, which many people identified as, you know, some of them are difficult opportunities like climate change, but they, it means that the game is changing in some way. Uh, different pressures and challenges, they managed to make a real impact on rules and behaviors. And they asked us to um, find a way to identify beacons of hope. And 
in this collaborative study, we identified 21 beacons of hope and then did extensive interviews with them, not evaluating them really, but really asking them their trajectory, what their story was, how they had a, a point of um, finding leverage, an acceleration point, what, where was their valley of death, because almost all of them have a valley of death at some point that then they managed to come out of on the other side. And it was really interesting. The report has just been published a few months ago, and I just give two examples here. Uh, one was Eosta. It's a private sector company in, in the Netherlands that does a lot of import-export of fruits and vegetables, especially with West Africa. And the other one was Zero Waste in San Francisco. Um, Eosta has, is a, a really socially conscientious company that has put a lot of their resources into in looking for tools and measures where they can understand much better their food chain and that, that their growers are benefiting from participating with them. And so they, they, on any product that you may buy in the Netherlands from um, Eosta, collaborating with the organization Nature and More, you can find out a lot about the producer. You can zero back into the producer and, and get that sort of information. Um, in a well, the, as well, they undertook with Nature and More to develop what they call the true cost of food, looking at these different characteristics of society, economy, climate, water, soil, biodiversity, and individual. They had metrics for all of these, and they can put it into, bring it down to, uh, you know, I won't go into the weeds here, but bring it down to how these relate to a particular apple or a particular pear, um, showing, for example, the water footprint on its arrival in European retail shelves. So uh, I'm very impressed that a private sector company is undertaking this, not being obliged to do so by any means, but they choose to. And uh, zero waste in San Francisco, we did, we were asked to have one uh, food waste initiative that we really looked at. And, and I found them very interesting as well because they, they have spent, a, their goal is absolute zero waste and they're getting rather close to it. And their goal was to change people's behavior. So to, to be able to change their behavior when they have something, some trash to throw out, they you know, very clearly put out recycling bins very carefully demarcated so that people understood it. They put out a lot of public awareness. Um, they did all of this for a number of years and then they instituted um, obligatory recycling. And so they, they didn't do it in a way that was penalizing people. It was people should by that time have the correct behavior and know what to do. And I think they worked, it has gone very, very well for them. I think they've, they've been very um, successful. Um, I think this is Hans. That's you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just sort of, okay. Yeah. Um, again, the food system provides a key leverage for change. So see, if we look at the system, uh, if you look just at one element, then you always wonder, you know, sort of, you know, where and what can I do with it? But what we want to go is, again, we look at the problem and then we go to the solution. And I think that's what we have explained right now in so many slides, you know, what, what the issues are. So from climate change, soil uh, degradation, erosion, loss of biodiversity, all the water issue we have in many places. Um, and then more of the social aspects, very important one, the poverty um, uh, and the lack of access to food, because again, of, of the means, not that the food is not there most of the time, because, oops, um, uh, the, because people don't have, don't have the access. Or again, you know, there's still areas in the world where there are uh, civil strife, war going on, uh, which again, makes it impossible for people to have the food. And then the whole issue of the non-communicable uh, diseases, which as we know, are mostly linked, uh, or mainly linked to um, um, the way we do agriculture. And you know, the solution again, the same, as, so they are there. So I think it's now time uh, just to get started. And um, what we have right now, we have a constellation out there, which is totally unique. We have a universally agreed framework for change. The U.S. have signed this, like the other 197 countries in the world, which are part of the U.N. They agreed on this, what? On the sustainable development goals. And this is very, very important. Uh, they are sort of the, um, they, they, they uh, um, come after the millennium development goals, uh, which uh, were only targeted to the developing countries. But then that created a lot of problems. Say, well, why do we have to do something and you guys just go on like 
before, like there's no problem. So people start to sit together. And uh, I'm very happy to say also that uh, my foundation and my institution are very much involved actually in the development of these SDGs, uh, starting with the Rio Plus 20 uh, conference. I was quite sort of the, the, the go ahead uh, for developing these goals. That was in 2012. And in 2015, in September, everybody agreed that SDGs is what we need uh, uh, to move ahead or to have a chance actually to, 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 to survive. And uh, so we have this framework here with the 17 goals. And uh, even if you look at agriculture, so if you look at what we want to do here and these solutions, they will contribute to many uh, of the goals. And actually, if you look very carefully, you can see that we contribute in one way or another almost to every one of them. So, so agriculture and the food system, so if we do our job well, uh, we can, we can uh, not guarantee full success in all the goals, but we can certainly make sure that we move the needle forward. And um, in my institute, the Minimum Institute, um, what we do, we do this system model, complex system models, and we take a country, and we have now uh, more than 20, which have done that I, integrated SDG system dynamic model, where we, uh, we can play scenarios and make investment in any one of those 17 goals, or 16, because the 17 is actually the bank. Um, and, and you can choose a number of policies, and we define the policies when we work with the country to customize the model. So th this, this model here, as far as I know, is the one we have looked at the Cote d'Ivoire, among many others. And, um, so if we do business as usual, so if you do nothing else than what you've done in the past 15 years, at the same rate of change, looking forward for 15 years, uh, that's business as usual. So you would achieve the goals by 26% only by 2030. Now, if you include agroecology policies in, the, in, in your SDGs, uh, you get to 34% achievement. Again, that, that's basically using the money available, the same money, not adding any more money, but just reallocating it to agroecological uh, policies. And that's not bad. And if you look at in, in uh, goal two, which is um, uh, no, uh, hunger, no hunger, we go from 12% to 51% achievement doing agroecology. Right? Poverty, uh, again, it moves quite a bit also, that's number one. Well, from two, uh, well, I can see this better here, uh, from, from now from 25 to 33. And you can look around in, in many other goals, you also get progress, although you don't invest directly. But the model, because the system model will show how other parts of the system move also. Interesting, I don't see one where it's going down or becoming less. And that may happen if you take money away from, let's say, health to put in agriculture, you could have a negative somewhere, maybe not directly in health, but somewhere else, who knows, um, maybe survival. Uh, but that, that's why these models are important because you can play out different scenarios and say, okay, which one will get us to the uh, objectives, to the goals? And uh, that model will actually uh, look at the 169 targets with our tables, we can print out and see how exactly everyone is moving. And so then you can think, oh, maybe I put a bit money here, a bit less there, what, can, what will happen? And so just to say that well, at least with agroecology, uh, it, it shows that this is something we need to do um, and uh, actually quite fast. But there's a caveat. We have to change behavior a little bit. Because, I mean, there is, as we say, you know, again, you said, there's enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. And that's really, that's, we're not going to get around that one. We don't have to go as extreme as George Monbiot will suggest, but I think we'll have to do some changes. In Europe, the EU did, a, a, I mean, IDRI, I-D-D-R-I, a French organization, doing fantastic work and reports. They did a study for Europe. And they show actually that, okay, we, by 2050, we can do quite well with agroecology. We can produce almost two and a half thousand calories per person per day, which is plenty. We should actually eat even less than that, right? Um, 
this is in calories or in gram per uh, person per day. But if we can see that this red thing here, this is meat and milk. So we have to reduce. And I think that that's something we has to do down on us sooner or later, the better the sooner, the best sooner, that we cannot go on with the meat consumption as it is today. And this is Europe. In Germany, meat is extremely cheap. People have been, the consumption is going up very, very rapidly. Um, so I, I, again, you know, the change is possible, is needed, but it will not happen without our involvement, our very personal involvement. And uh, if you think government has no say what's in your plate, that's fine. Make your own decision and see what happens to your children and grandchildren. I think, you know, we have to start to become thinking a bit ahead ourselves also. And I can see at least the young generation is trying. I hope it won't be too late for them to actually, you know, take over from us. And the sooner they do it, the better, I think. And now, how are we going to do it? You know, we, we, what, what is the mechanism which I think will get us there? Barbara. So we're really interested in looking at what, what could be these engines of change. Uh, certainly individual choices about diets is a really important one. But if we want to really look across countries and, and whole regions, where can we find some leverage points? And so um, there's some growing initiatives on this concept of true cost accounting in food and agriculture. And um, the idea being that, that we really have to change our metrics. The metric right now in agriculture is yield, a sort of singular metric. And if we really recognize what agriculture and food gives us, it's far more than, than simply yields. And we're not doing well on yields, we're over yielding. Um, so if we can, we can fix those metrics to understand what our goals should be. Um, and yeah, so there have been a number of publications on measuring what matters in agriculture and food systems. And, and a, a really important part of this, I think, is recognizing that when you look at this is what's called externalities to economists. I'm not sure I always understand it so well, but um, economists dwell a lot on externalities and there have been a number of uh, carried out by the same United Nations initiative, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity. They've looked at a lot of sectors before they got to agriculture and food. They looked at, at mining, for example, and I don't think there's many, um, many ways that mining can be positive for biodiversity. So it tends to be the negative externalities of, of mining, but we really work to change the mindset here that in agriculture, there's positive externalities as well as negative externalities. Agriculture is really capable of generating many benefits to people, food and many other benefits as well. Um, carried out the wrong way, there's many negative externalities, but don't forget the positive side of it. And I can speak, I mean, just this is just a small uh, side note, but from the standpoint of pollination, if a field um, is, has a lot of crops in it and crops that have flowers and they're not spraying pesticides, you will find a higher diversity of bees in that field than you will in a, a natural forest right next to it. We've seen this in Kenya and in New Jersey. It's, it, it can really be, it can foster greater biodiversity if, if managed well. So this is the framework that's been developed through this, it's called the TEAV, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity for Agriculture and Food. I've been involved in it for a couple of years, really recognizing that it's not simply the produced capital, but it's the social capital and the human capital um, that is based on the natural capital and how we work with that through the agriculture and food chain. Um, there's a sort of foundation study that's come out on this and now they're developing more, they're more sort of uh, specific ways that this inclusive evaluation framework can be applied, looking at the stocks, the capital basis, the flows through the value chain and the outcomes, but being sure to look at it through all of these, produced capital, natural capital, human capital, and social capital, and bringing in very much the impacts on, for example, on health and, nutri and um, diets and nutrition. So let's just say that the, today's dominant lens versus the tea bag foods provo proposed evaluation framework expands from the narrow field of per hectare productivity, saying that is really not a comprehensive valuation framework. The universal evaluation framework right now, we're working on developing the, how it specifically can be applied in a number of instances of business analysis, international accounts, national accounts for ecosystem services and 
and natural resources. Um, the UN is adopting this as, as so that GNP would not be the only accounting that is taken account of, but also uh, natural capital. Agricultural management systems, ways of evaluating policy, if you do this or you do that. Uh, what would be the impacts on these different forms of capital in, the, in agricultural policy, and then dietary comparisons and what the impl Im implications of that would be. Um, we had carried out a, a, at FAO, we had carried out an initial um, study on ecosystem services in different management systems of rice in Asia, uh, where a lot of the mentality is that, that if you manage for yields, Yes, okay, you will sacrifice ecosystem services, but if you manage for ecosystem services, you will inevitably have lower yields. And we looked at these different kinds of farming systems, conservation agriculture, integrated farming systems, which means integrating rice and fish, usually, um, integrated pest management, organic, systems of rice cultivation, and heritage cultivation systems. And in all of them, you can see, just to interpret the, the graph for you, the, the quadrant in the upper right is, uh, ones where there were both positive outcomes for ecosystem services and positive outcomes for yield. And that was overwhelmingly in all of these systems, there are large benefits that can be experienced beyond yields in uh, managing for ecosystem services as well. <clears throat> and then more recently, they had asked me to take that, the, the TEAB framework and apply it to rice value chain pathways in Senegal. And uh, just to go over this sort of um, briefly, it's getting late, we don't want to keep you too long, but just rice is a very valued crop in Senegal and Senegal has had large production increases, but it doesn't keep up with the level of consumption. There's still a very large import of rice into Senegal. Um, rice self-sufficiency has decreased over time. So it's an area of high priority for government policy. The rice is, is produced around the world traditionally by millions of small-scale farmers. It isn't something that easily lends itself to large-scale cultivation, although there's attempts to make it that way. Um, rice paddies that sculpt the land serve as a form of water storage, supply, um, uh, and they also deliver erosion control. When rice is grown under organic conditions, it creates its own agricultural ecosystem of what many scientists have considered to be unrivaled complexity. The biodiversity in a rice paddy is tremendous. Um, and it holds really unique cultural value, values for many societies. So we, um, we applied the TEAP framework, but the, right now I'm in a lot of dialogue with the TEAP framework because they are asking that we apply monetary valuation to every aspect there, every ecosystem service along the value chain. And we, when I was asked to do this, I didn't want to do that. Um, I wanted, first of all, to go to the, the stakeholders and ask them what they thought were the primary issues in rice cultivation in Senegal, and then to apply a systems thinking to this. If they, they felt that what they were concerned about was large-scale concentration of mills, if you did it differently, what would be the implications throughout the whole system? And that doesn't mean... I, I, there wouldn't be a way to apply a dollar sign to every little step along that. It's really the, the implications along the system, and some of it doesn't root through money. Um, so we went through all of the value chain and asked our stakeholders to tell us what they felt were the main, main issues around, say, pest and weed management. That's in the production side, in the processing side, uh, ownership of processing facilities, distribution, organization of the market, and in consumption. Uh, rice is a very traditional dis dish in Senegal. And in the end, bringing in the, the perspective of all these stakeholders, I felt was like, a, like making lasagna. I'm, I lived in Italy for a long time, and uh, you know, any one layer of the lasagna is really not very interesting, but it's really the combination of putting them all together, the richness of the observation that you get from having our stakeholders were farmers, civil society, researchers, and a governance think tank. And I felt that that really created a robust statement of what the issues were which we, sorry, we didn't go back there, but we put that all into this, um, into a model and looked at the implications of adopting the existing government policy, which is to take out large loans from World Bank and the African Development Bank for agribusiness zones, concentration of mills, large scale irrigation schemes versus what our stakeholders felt that they would like to see, which would be smaller, medium to small sized mills where the byproducts could be used for animal feed, could have more cooperative and community ownership, um, and they could also uh, work with different, in different varieties of rice, which were very important to different communities. And the implications in the systems model then were showing that if, if 
Senegal did not take out these large loans and have to pay so much money back in interest, that money, a small, even a smaller portion of that money could be plowed into farmer training, investment in these smaller mills, and the implications, we actually looked at the implications on the sustainable development goal attainment, and the implications for things that you wouldn't immediately put together, but it was clear when you did it in the model, were things like um, women's empowerment um, and youth employment and areas that were, were really critical to, to uh, sustainable development goals as well. So I'm, I'm arguing with them that they should really try to look at more systems thinking and not put dollar signs on, on nature, which I don't believe you can do in any case. And the other initiative I've been involved with that Robin had mentioned was that um, when we did get an opening on agroecology at FAO, then part of the pushback from governments has been saying, um, Where's the evidence? You know, where, where do we, how do we know very much about agroecology? We need to, to understand it better. And that's partly that they haven't looked very well, but it's also partly that, that there has been such an underinvestment in agroecology, in research and documentation of it. So it's, it's a harder slog to be able to, to really put it up there against other systems and say these, it has these particular benefits. Um, but they appointed this panel and, and I participated in it. And they, it's all the governments who say what kind of study they want. So the governments who really wanted, say, biotechnology and green revolution to continue, they call that innovation systems. And so we were supposed to, to look at agroecology and other innovation systems, which is a real challenge. Um, we decided to, to compare agroecology with other sort of systems that are being promoted or in some senses pushed, uh, sustainable intensification, climate smart agriculture, and then organic permaculture, sustainable food value chains, nutrition sensitive agriculture and rights based approach. And our remit was specifically how these contribute to food security and nutrition. And we really went against what we were sort of told to do because we didn't take innovation as being only technological innovation. We really worked on the definition of, of innovation, which is very much how people understand it now. That's a very old definition to see it as, as simply a matter of technology transfer. But we really uh, felt that innovation involves challenging the status quo. Um, it's the process of innovation, how it happens is as important as the product. Um, and that a really important element is democratizing and, and uh, promoting responsible innovation through co-creation of knowledge of the stakeholders and researchers and multiple stakeholders and that innovation is inherently localized. So um, I don't want to go in, in too much in, into the details here, but in the end we were able to pull together through a, a number of really systematic reviews of these different farming systems such as agroecology, organic, um, agroforestry, permaculture and Food sovereignty, which as, a, as an approach is quite different from the other ones, but it still is, was one that we wanted to keep in the mix. Um, and then others, those grouped rather naturally and then sustainable intensification and related approaches in how they contribute to different elements of what the governments have decided themselves are the elements of uh, sustainable agriculture and food security and really find that there are multiple benefits of agroecological approaches and those more ecological approaches in attaining food security. That food security is not simply producing more food, it has so many elements around people's um, empowerment and their ability to choose their food as well. Um, and ultimately in the conclusion of our report, which has now been accepted somewhat reluctantly, but it's been accepted by the, not reluctantly. There was, I mean, there is always a coalition of governments which don't really agree with this, which tends to be our government, Canada, Argentina, um, New Zealand and Australia. But anyway, they eventually went around, came along and agreed that sustainable inf intensification is incremental, climate smart agriculture. These moves are, they're good, they have value, but they're very incremental. And at, what we need is transform, transformation and agroecological approaches requiring input reduction, natural processes and addressing power asymmetries is transformational. And there's many transition path pathways from different starting points in different contexts. Um, and this was sort of a diagram that we used of, of uh, transition pathways from high diversity, the uh, left side is high diversity to low diversity and then on the bottom is low food productivity to high food productivity from natural ecosystems to traditional food system, farming systems. There are several different 
avenues that can be pursued and different ways that the trajectory can come about, um, one can go from traditional farming systems to agroecological systems. One can also go from conventional agricultural systems to agroecological systems. And in, as the next steps, the, um, again, we're being asked to produce more evidence. I don't want to go into the details here, but this is something that we're really aware of, that we need to have much better documentation of agroecology. And much of the documentation tends to come from um, NGOs, community groups, um, and it often is not necessarily laid out in a way that you can use it to compare with other areas. So we've been working on a kind of protocol where we could be more systematic about how case studies are developed. And that's something we want to bring into the Sustainable Food Systems Program at Prescott, because a lot of your students do carry out case studies. And if they can be excellent documentations of what happened in one place in particular, but also contribute to a larger statement of what trends are and what, what, where we could find valuable pathways, that would be a real contribution. Um, I think it could be, be very interesting to people far beyond Prescott. So, Hans. We're going to the end, sorry, it's been very long, but um, back to the SDGs. So we have choices and I think, you know, we need to make the right ones. Again, because we have the evidence, we have tools, uh, we, we can play scenarios, we, we have what it takes in order to convince our decision makers, I think. Um, what we don't have is the money to help the process like the other side. And I think so we have to outsmart them in some ways and I think we can. And if we use our tools, if we use the SDGs more, I think we, we, can, we can get there. And um, again, so we have the SDGs. If we work our way through with agroecology, we can actually get where we want to go here, you know, into the green zone of these planetary uh, boundaries. And um, we want to thank you for your attention and apologize for the length. Um, it's very comprehensive, so you always can go back to the PowerPoint uh, for more information or write to us if you like to. Thank you very much. So Barbara and Hans are open and willing for questions. Um, we should be able to have questions from our online audience also, um, but we do, um, for the benefit of the online audience, ask you to please come to the microphone that is set up there, but uh, certainly welcome your questions. Thank you. And online, don't be shy. It'll be in the chat. So if you can type in the chat, then that will get, uh, get the message through. Hi, my name is Brianna. Um, transferred here, was doing sustainable agriculture at a previous college. Came with the sustainable agriculture revamp of this program, um, doing the Masters of Sustainable Food Systems um, here online. And thank you for coming and talking because this is a this is an amazing opportunity. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'll just ask like a few. Um, one thing specifically, so like we're doing a lot of with the gardens on campus, especially like planning, because um, the season's coming up. So one important question that I had, you stressed the important of importance of like root root crops and rotations. Um, so I just wanted to know like why specifically root crops, and I know that you mentioned that they were like decreasing um, in popularity, but. I mean, uh, I don't know, in this climate here, you must know what grows best, but, you know, root crop like potatoes, for example, I don't know if they grow here. I'm not sure exactly what altitude we are, I didn't check that. I know the snow now out there is pretty cold. Um, that's certainly one of them, uh, which you, you could uh, uh, grow, and um, I don't know much more, uh, you know, what other root crops, but I guess the more people have been living here long enough uh, probably know what 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 can grow in, in terms of root crop but they are important i wouldn't say that you know sugar beets because that's 
not really very smart, but you know, in terms of vegetables, you, you have um, you know, the oral crop, like um, uh, the beets, yeah, there are all kinds of beets you, you, can, you can grow, uh, kohlrabi, I mean, although they are sort of halfway up, halfway down, but these, these are good crops in, in a rotation because they also have fairly deep roots. Uh, system. So, so that's what I would do. Cool. Um, oh, just like an observation um, of like a reoccurring theme was like the the nations that are refusing um, agroecology um, and doing like a lot of sustainable food systems research. It just it seems like all of these nations like have found their found their wealth on agriculture in these systems and and when somebody gets power they don't want to let it go and i think that that's just like a common theme and important to acknowledge is like yeah because the u.s is is a pretty big player in or founder in industrial agriculture systems and that's the way that the system is set up to benefit the there but thoughts on that <laughs> we just res respond to that that no absolutely i mean if you think of one of the ones who are really um create the, the largest barriers and and really try to shut down agroecology it is really big agricultural producers but that shows you how how strong the lobby is yeah. within those countries yeah i think another reason why change is sometimes difficult is because of the huge investments which have been made Oh, they're made again in, in institutions, but also in the research labs, uh, all the equipment. I mean, if you think about how much value equipment is out on those farms, which m many of those pieces of equipment would be obsolete. Mm -hmm. And we know from farmers who have been trying in Kansas and other places in the US who actually are trying to move to uh, cover crops, n no herbicide or very little, uh, no, no, no synthetic fertilizer, they need new machinery and actually they are partly developing it themselves because they can't get the industry to, to produce machinery which would be useful because the, the, the market right now is too small. So, you know, there's always sort of a, a, a stage where you, you can try things, it, it works, but in order to go to the next step, it needs again new investment and the certainty that this works and there will be a market. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for those new uh, pieces of equipment. So I think that's one problem. I know it's investment made and what is needed in the future to actually uh, support that change. I think um, also on, I'm sorry, my coffee's on. Um, like the machinery mentioned, um, like every, every farmer has to have their own machinery instead of doing like a community sharing. And I think that that's also part of the capitalistic system of, of, is individualization. Um, so that was just, yeah. Everybody has to have their own instead of the community and like this system that you're all talking about. See how bursting with ideas we are because of your talk. This is great. And I wanna thank you both so much for coming. I wanna thank Robin for bringing you. And I'm also you know, bursting with ideas. And I believe and trust in and I'm inspired by your vision of transformation that has to happen. And it's largely a transformation of decentralization. Lots more small farmers with lots more diverse crops. But I can't help but worry about the impediments, especially of landlessness. People may, we may win the good fight symbolically, biodiversity, but if people don't have land um, in a way to enact this in a decentralized way, um, what do we do? How do we confront landlessness and debt? And maybe this is a couched way of saying, how deep must the transformation go? Can we move agroecologically under capitalism and private property might be the big question, or you might stick with what do we do? Is land reform part of your vision? Uh, and thanks again for coming. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's a harder question, but it's certainly we, we can't just play around at the edges and try to make you know try to make it pretty and, and make it better. I think the whole scale transformation really has to involve the economic system, and has to, you know has to deal with with the issues that you're talking about. I mean, we can imagine a future. We can imagine a future where, as we showed um, under agroecology, there's much greater employment in rural areas, and with increasing building on that diversity. Um, but that's not going to 
that's not going to happen without some major change in, in the economic system. I think we should probably be more courageous in, in just putting that forward. Yeah. Hey, just, just to reinforce that, you know, we, a member of the Club of Rome also, and uh, last year we had a meeting in Rome, the 50th anniversary, and um, so, okay, so we got two new president, co-presidents, uh, young ladies, so there's a lot of energy back in the Club of Rome because, you know, 50 years ago, we published uh, the book, Limits to Growth, and uh, then made some waves, died, but we came to the conclusion in many of our discussion that we have to change the economic system. This system who brought us into the situation we are today, and we've seen plenty of it, cannot take us out of it. And, and, and that's probably the, the, the one of the, the biggest, difficult, most difficult part of it. How do we change the economic system? A system which values all kinds of costs, where the more sick people you have, the, the more GDP you have, the, the better you are in some ways. It, it can't work, right? And so we, we, are, we have been challenging the economists out there to, to say, okay, no, how could a, a, a new economic system look like? And also an economic system right now where 1% owns more than half, right? And the inequity which is still growing under that economic system. Never mind if it's in China or here, it's the same pattern. So obviously something has to change somewhere. Um, because if we continue on this path, uh, there'll be war, guaranteed, right? And how long are people will take it? You know, French Revolution, eventually they got it up here and then they go and do something. And um, I think that's the path we are on unless we do something, because the food will be more expensive, never mind going organic or agroecologic, just because of climate change. If we don't have a system that can produce under new constraints, and well enough, then we're going to have these problems, I mean, clearly. So this, so this we, we can see that come unless we make that change. And um, I don't have a solution. I'm not an economist. I don't really know how to change it. Uh, and that's why I think we need to challenge people out there to say, look, all right, you know, analyze this a bit more in detail and see, okay, what are our possible paths uh, in terms of another economic system? But the system who rewards yeah, more inequity on a daily basis, as we can see, and not only here, but it's, it's global. I, I really am very pessimistic then. Although and we have the technologies, we have innovation, we know what to do to actually to solve our practical food uh, system issues. But on top of that is still the economic system in which we are embedded. And, and if that doesn't somehow also change along, uh, I'm not so sure that uh, we're going to make it. So, so again, it, it's really important that we, we, we look at many different spheres. And uh, that's something I, I really uh, hope to do more, you know, also in our model, to find out, you know, these leverage points. Um, where are they? Because many of them come from the investment side also. Who invests what and where? And then we're very quickly at the land issues, which is the biggest headache in so many countries where, okay, you know, it's been privatized and people can do what? You know, it's not because you own a piece of land that you can destroy it, right? But right now it is. If you own it, I can go dig around, I can do whatever, I can put pesticides, and I, I ruin a common good. How is, you know, how do we come to the point that we allow this to begin with? You know, you can sort of ask yourself, so historically, you know, how did we get there? To, to, to destroy our, our, our living bases just because we, we can own it individually. So, so, so these are all important no, thought. And again, in, in a place like this one, I think that's where people need to think and come up with ideas. So I hope that it will be, uh, will challenge some of you <laughs> to, to, to think about this. Um, and we're happy to contribute our little piece uh, <laughs> when we can and what we can. But, uh, um, we need to work hard and fast. Hello. <clears throat> so you, you asked uh, how we got here, and it seem, it's obvious to me that the real battle is kind of the psychological one. 
this idea that the hamburger is patriotic is the problem we deal with. It's like a myth that we have to kind of deconstruct. So I wonder what kind of worldwide initiatives are actually dealing with that side of the conflict of destroying our planet. I think what's happening right now with uh, Greta and many others, you know, it's all of a sudden I think people realize, oh, I mean, the next generation decides that, no, we, we, they can see it on the wall. It's painted there in, in their reality, even outside. And they say, no, we don't want to deal with this. So we, we want the change. And I, I, that's why I'm sort of uh, somehow optimistic that something will change. Um, on the other hand, I, I worry sometimes that people think it's too late, so let's just enjoy it. And when I look at the youth out there, I mean, uh, there is, s s some are very committed and others already have given up, I think. And uh, that's, that's, so I think, too, so you have a big job to make sure that everybody comes in, goes along and say, hey, no, we want something else and we can do it. I think there's, no, yes, we can do it. I think it's something which, Great, I know that try to instill uh, to, to the youth. You know? And um, hopefully it will be strong enough as a movement you know, to, uh, to make it, to, to go over and, and have a change in that system. Because you know, so, sooner or later, in, in like 20 years, well, you guys are gonna be the one in decision makers, right? Hopefully, even before, even way before, why not? But that means people have to go and vote. In my own country, back in Switzerland, when there's a, a very critical issue, maybe 60% of people go and vote and mostly the old people. So I mean, what's going on? You ask them, they say, oh, uh, it doesn't make a change. It doesn't make a difference anyway, if I go and vote or not. I say, no, that's not true. If you all go, it will make a difference because when we are counting votes, right? We're not just guesstimating how many people did, said something like uh, they did in the past. And when I asked a group of high schooler between 16 and 18 year old in, in Switzerland in December, I gave a talk in Basel, which is not a fairly large city, right? But the people are sort of know what's going on. Out of 300 kids, only 10 raised their hand when I said, do you know about the SDGs? I mean, I got after the teachers. I mean, I said, I mean, I almost I said, look, what is this possible? So what are you doing? I tell them, what are you doing? And the teachers in front row there. So, <laughs> so you know, if people don't know that this exists and they can use that to actually go and argue to do something, to, to, to go and and, uh, and sue your government like the Dutch did because nothing is happening, you know, who, who's going to do something? They, so, so we need the media have to start to pick up these things. I mean, I'd never seen a word about SDGs in any of a New York Times article, except when there's a conference in uh, New York or wherever, what I read. Do you, do you, Robin, do you think everybody knows here about SDGs? Yeah. No? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, negative there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please look into this because that gives you, this is universally agreed. You, 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 this is legally binding agreement. It's legally binding. Every state in America will have to deliver and together as, as a country. Like in Switzerland, every canton has to deliver and as a country we have to deliver. Never mind, it's the situation in the same Switzerland than here, okay? You go out in the street, almost nobody knows. It, 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 it is a disaster when you think, but if, if I go to Nairobi, probably more people will know in the street what it is than here. And where is the problem? The problem is here, not in Nairobi. If it's in Nairobi, it's because of here. And in my country, in Europe, and who knows why. So, 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 so to me, it looks like, you know, we need to start to use the, the, the agreements and the policies we have to make those changes. So we need to work from top down, but from bottom up. We continue to work bottom up, show it works, yes, we can do it. At the same time, that these examples have to become part of the decision-making uh, uh, process. They have to feed in. We, we want science and evidence 
to, to help develop the policies and not the politics or just the money. If not, we land exactly where we are now. So, so that's a bit uh, what I can say. But again, take advantage of, of what, what you have now in your hands. So I wonder if uh, the leverage points you guys are looking for are within practical means of the everyday person, them changing their individual lives more so than this top-down changing the system that we are probably going to be struggling with for a long time. Yeah, the greatest hope I have is, is for democratizing information, that that's something that it, the people do feel like they can make a change and then they pay attention to it. And, and, and uh, really using, I agree with you. I mean, it, it is, you need to do it both, both, but you'll probably see a lot more movement from individuals rather than, than from something top down. Uh, Hans used the example of Kenya. And, you know, we could learn from some of these other countries. So in Kenya, the, the budget is something that is hotly debated and it's front page information in the newspaper where the, the government budget is going and everybody knows about it. And, and they don't, you know, it's not necessarily allocated well, but it is something that people discuss. You know, just people on the street are going to be discussing it. We're so far removed from that here. You know, we let that top sort of thing just go on and feel like we can't have anything to do with it. So, no, I really, I really do feel that, that, you know, the individual engagement is going to be key. And I also feel when we look for leverage points that um, I'm not sure that we'll get everyone to be impassioned about the environment as much as I think they should. But when, you, when people do understand the link between health and the environment, and it becomes personal, and it becomes something that really, really uh, has to do with the future of their families. I think that's that's a really strong leverage point, a very real and strong leverage point. Yeah. But don't you think that? the type of people we're electing makes a big difference. Like if you don't have $10 million, you can't get elected in this country. So, I mean, it's not, I think everything is tied together between chemicals, machinery, money, lobbyists, politicians, politicians, politicians. I think that is, it's the type of people we're electing, I think is one of the big issues that we have because the regular person, no one in this room, could run successfully. They don't have any money backing them up. So, I mean, that's just. I, I actually want to take this one because we've been doing a lot of um, talking recently about, um, you know, where, where these leverage points are for influencing uh, more sustainable food systems. And there's a really excellent um, uh, toolkit and research that's coming out of, of Vermont in the Farm uh, to Plate Network that is specifically looking at uh, local planning committees and commissions. And we, we could all <laughs> participate in our very localized government structures. And there aren't the same needs for financial um, you know, contributions to begin with. And so then that is where, you know, if we start paying attention to what's happening in, in our own communities and even engaging ourselves, those of us with the privilege of access to information about how to make food systems more sustainable, then, then you start shifting. And if we start doing that community by community, that's not a lot of money for engagement. Actually, you know, you can't even pay some folks in some communities, if you look at the number of open seats on local planning commissions and in local government, that's, that's also embarrassing um, for us, but that's also a, a point of engagement. And so something that folks who are uh, concerned about food systems are really starting to dig in there because they're starting to understand that step one, no, no budget step one. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't dis, I don't disagree with you at all. Yeah, but I'm an optimist, so I always have, I feel like, you know, right? What do we do? What do we do at the local level? We can and engage. We can. So, yeah. So I think I'll take the opportunity of having, having the mic. Was, was there a question uh, from? Um, the SAR program has done, the SAR program has done much to support sustainable agriculture in the U.S., starting with very small cotton and the areas of research 
terms of discussion with me are especially important. I think some of this is also important. Okay, so the question was, is the SARE program in the United States has done quite a bit to advance sustainable agricultural practices, but are there any particular um, areas of, of uh, activities or areas that sh uh, could or should be receiving more funding? I'll give an answer to that just because we, I've had a relationship with the, the SARE program in our little valley in, in California, um, and I do feel very strongly, I think that that they're a really good organization and their focus is good. We, ha we have um, been promoting this idea of farmer researcher uh, collaboratives and having farmers define the research agenda. And we put together a proposal from the farmers in our valley who are very innovative organic farmers and they have many experiences and many failures as well, but the failures you learn from. And we had this idea of crowdsourcing cover cropping in the valley. And we put a proposal together to the Organic Farming Research Foundation who came back and told us it wasn't scientific enough, that farmers aren't scientific enough. We had researchers involved, but they, they didn't feel that we had a good hypothesis and it just wasn't scientific enough and SAR our proposal now is into SAR and they've made positive moves about it and I think that they do really respect farmers smallholders and the knowledge that comes from there so it, it isn't one research agenda it's uh, it's the idea of farmers setting the research agenda and building the research off of that All right, so in the, uh, the interest of expediency and urgency <laughs> that we all have things that we can be uh, going off and doing, especially with our, our meal choices for dinner, those of us who have, have the privilege of, of that choice, um, you can start uh, with your next meal. And so I thank you all very much for uh, coming today and joining us uh, online and viewing the presentation at a later time. If, um, if you were able to. So thank you very much. We invite you to, um, of course, contact uh, uh, Barbara and Hans. They shared their uh, details on a previous slide. Um, we invite you, of course, to uh, learn more about sustainable food systems and, of course, about sustainable food systems at Prescott College. So thank you very much uh, for coming today. Thank you.